Our subject today, federalism and the scope of federal criminal law, will no doubt strike legal sophisticates as quaint, reflecting as it does a touching nostalgia for simpler days that are now beyond recall. <laughs> After all, as we are constantly reminded, the Tenth Amendment and the principle of federalism it was supposed to protect are now no more than the constitutional equivalents of a vermiform appendix. Unfortunately, it is hard to disagree given the Supreme Court's decision three years ago in Garcia. Yet hope springs eternal in the Federalist breast, and the fact that this panel should be discussing this topic today demonstrates either the truth of the proposition that some people are destined never to get the word, or that federalism has a philosophic validity and pragmatic utility that over time will force a rediscovery of its constitutional relevance. Of course, the Federalist principle was not always, has not always been considered an archaeological curiosity. In a lecture de delivered towards the end of the last century, the great British historian Lord Acton had this to say about our Constitution as originally enacted. And I quote, the Federal Constitution did not deal with the question of religious liberty. Slavery was deplored, was denounced, and was retained. Weighed in the scales of liberalism, the instrument as it stood was a monstrous fraud. And yet, by the development of the principle of federalism, it has produced a community more powerful, more prosperous, more intelligent, and more free than any other which the world has seen. This assessment was by no means unique to Acton. During most of our history, federalism was considered one of the essential elements of the American polity. Thus, what is surprising about today's topic is not that it should be discussed at this time, but rather that it should never have been discussed before. Because as far as we have been able to determine, before today, no public forum, no learned journal has ever sought to examine the constitutional limits of federal criminal law from the Federalist perspective. After all, the expansion of federal criminal authority in areas that had previously been the exclusive concern of state and local governments is hardly new. It was 116 years ago with the enactment of the Post Office Act of 1872 that Congress first used its postal authority to criminalize acts that posed no obvious threat to federal interests, namely the use of the mails to commit fraud, conduct lotteries, and distribute obscene material. From this humble beginning, Congress has found it necessary and proper in the exercise of its postal and commerce powers to impose criminal sanctions on an ever-growing catalog of activities. Over time, Congress has been shown particular ingenuity in realizing the potential of the Commerce Clause. Whereas in earlier days it was usually necessary to establish that a person or object had actually crossed a state line before federal criminal sanctions could be invoked, <clears throat> it is nowadays quite enough in many cases that the prescribed act be found to affect commerce. And given the unlimited uh, imagination of our lawmakers and the seemingly unlimited tolerance of uh, federal courts, today it is virtually impossible to conjure up any human activity, with a possible exception, I suppose, of daydreaming, <laughs> that some court will not find to burden interstate commerce. Witness the Supreme Court's 1971 decision in Paris versus United States, which found a quintessentially local, loan sharking operation to affect interstate commerce. As Justice St Stewart pointed out in dissent, under the statute the court majority had voted to uphold, quote, a man can be convicted without any proof of interstate movement or of the use of the facilities of interstate commerce or of facts showing that his conduct affected interstate commerce. I think, Justice Stewart continued, that the framers of the Constitution never intended that the national government might define as a crime and prosecute such wholly local activity through the enactment of federal criminal laws. 
This encroachment uh, on state and local turf has had its practical consequences. With the proliferation of federal criminal statutes has inevitably come an exercise of dual sovereignty over large areas of criminal activity. And with dual sovereignty, the prospect of dual prosecutions and of exposure to double jeopardy, in fact, if not always in nice legal theory. It is hardly surprising that such problems have raised concerns over the reach of federal prosecutions, although these concerns have generally been in terms of utilitarian rather than uh, constitutional issues. There is something inherently haphazard about criminal laws that depend on the often fortuitous crossing of a state line. As Judge Henry Friendly once observed, I quote, why should the federal government care if a Manhattan businessman takes his mistress to sleep with him in Greenwich, Connecticut, although it would not if the love nest were in Port Chester, New York? Why should the federal government be concerned with a $100 robbery uh, <clears throat> from a federally insured savings bank, although it is not if someone burned down Macy's? Judge Friendly's remarks were directed to the rationality and efficiency rather than to the constitutional legitimacy of certain exercises of federal criminal authority. He did not reach the issue we address today, namely the limits, if any, that are imposed by the Federalist principle on the scope of that authority. That inquiry seems to have lain dormant these many decades and has only lately been brought into focus by the Supreme Court's decision last year in McNally versus United States, which found that the mail statute, a fraud statute, did not prohibit, quotes, schemes to defraud citizens of their intangible rights to honest and impartial government. It tells us something about the prevailing orthodoxy, I think, that this decision created headlines not because it marked a further intrusion of federal authority into state and local affairs, but because it marked a federal retreat. And I might add, it also tells us something of the limits of philosophy and even the most philosophically driven presidency, because the Reagan administration's response to McNally has been to approve a bill that will grant the federal government explicit authority to prosecute political corruption at the state and local levels. Nonetheless, the McNally decision sparked a debate among Federalist society moles within the Department of Justice that focused not on whether such prosecutions could be arguably squeezed within one of the federal government's delegated powers, but whether they encroached on responsibilities constitutionally reserved to the states. This debate, I am told, was the genesis of the topic this panel has been assigned this morning and will now proceed to discuss. We now turn to our panelists who will speak to us in inverse alphabetical order. This is a nod to the counter-revolutionary mood of the society. <laughs> uh, our first uh, panelist is Professor William Van Alstein. Uh, <coughs> Perkins, a professor of law at Duke University. He earned his law degree at Stanford Law School. Professor Van Alstein has served as a member of the National Board of Directors of the American Civil Liberties Union and can no doubt certify uh, that being a card-carrying member of the ACLU does not necessarily disqualify one for public office. Professor Van Alstein also has the distinction of having served in the early 1970s as a consultant to the Senate Judiciary Committee on Certain Watergate Matters. He has been president of the American Association of University Professors and has uh, published numerous articles in the field of criminal law. Professor Van Alstein. I'm the, I'm the archaeologist of this panel uh, in terms of the description that has been provided you. I have an excellent manuscript that runs about 24 pages that I prepared for this occasion, none of which I have time to read since I'm confined to 12 minutes. Anticipating that difficulty, 
I reduced my remarks to uh, three pages, uh, 150 copies of which have been distributed. And anticipating that I might not cover the three pages, I covered those with one page, which shows you three graphics. And that indeed is a summary of what I will devote myself to. The pictures that I have provided you propose three models of federalism and the scope of national substantive criminal law on a constitutional foundation. Two of these models, I trust, after a first glance, may become at once familiar to you. The third and first one, I suspect, is entirely novel, though I will spend a few minutes with that. Judge Buckley has uh, suggested that uh, the, the classic tension in which people are interested, if they are interested in the subject at all, is primarily between the allocation of power to the national government and, quote, the states. That's a perfectly correct description, to be sure. Uh, yet I want to look at it in a slightly different way and to try to advertise, therefore, the congruence of my pedigree as a former member of the National Board of Directors of the ACLU and this puzzling emphasis upon states' rights, which will try to orient my talk to you in a, uh, in, in a light I find more congenial. The interest in civil liberties, for my own sake and more generally, is not exactly fungible philosophically or in my own view with states' rights. It is rather an opportunity by means of which people in the United States may attempt to find a community which is congenial to them by any one of three ways, the last of which makes the principles of federalism absolutely indispensable. One of those ways, of course, is by means of the First Amendment, by giving expression to one's own point of view as to what the laws ought to be in the community where one lives and by prevailing as a member of the majority, bring that law into effect to establish the conditions of protection and choice that one prefers, correspondingly to vote, but third, to exit. That is to say, to take up and move to some other community where the social attitude toward standards of decency, toward the act of sodomy, may indeed be different. It may be less permissive or more permissive than the alternative culture. And I start with that point, partly because I see in the literature of the Federalist Society itself a certain neat schizophrenia. There is in the publication that is often used, and quite rightly, to recruit members to the Federalist Society, an emphasis on civil liberties, separation of powers, and federalism. There is also a note in the interest of using national power to bring about a more conservative society. So I start then with this humdrum example of sodomy because it conflicts us in that respect. The Supreme Court, as you're well aware, has declined to hold unconstitutional state criminal statutes prohibiting sodomy. I do, by chance, agree that it is not unconstitutional for states so to decide. You may know that almost half the states prohibit it, half the states do not. You may not know that about a dozen states not only do not prohibit it, but establish it as a civil right. That is to say, as a matter of private choice, which is no one else's business to use in a legal way adverse to one's interest, the civil rights statute of the state of California makes it a civil wrong to discriminate in business environments based upon the sexual orientation of the residents of that state. A majority of the persons in my jurisdiction may find that almost criminally indecent. I assume that at least a prevailing majority of California residents find that it speaks well of the condition of civil liberty. Federalism alone is what makes it possible when one's voice and vote fails Rather than to exile oneself from the United States by moving all the way to Holland or Denmark, as the example might be, of seeking shelter in some community whose orientation as to what is and is not acceptable, what shall be and shall not be punishable, what kinds of human life taking may be excusable self-defense or not excusable self-defense, that these large margins of difference permit one, therefore, to escape 
a monochromatic homogeneity that always results in the imposition of a single national law. Thus, my own interest in this topic is not to be misunderstood or, in fact, elderly understood as, quote, the turf of states' rights. For there is, of course, on the darker side of federalism, a concession to the ferocity of state autonomy when it may tend to operate in pernicious ways, in a way which one then would like to overrule, preempt, or veto by national authority. My view of that is that it is always a danger, but that it is superintended not by Congress preempting the states in general, but by the restrictions perfectly rightly imposed by the states by the 14th Amendment to protect all persons against state action of a fundamentally pernicious character and indeed to enable Congress to enforce that protection by suitable national law. It is therefore a doubtful proposition in the first instance as to pursuant to what complement of enumerated powers, very few of which were originally and indeed have ever been vested in Congress, pursuant to which nationwide intolerant majorities now demand having things entirely their own way from sea to shining sea. The model which prevails in the United States, as Judge Buckley has, has already uh, wittily introduced, is featured on the handout that I provided you, in Roman numeral three, called the Modernist View. I will look at it briefly and then simply contrast two others, including the first, which I've introduced precisely because I think it's so interesting, so sharply contrasting, and intellectually, uh, so uh, uh, curiously defensible. In this third model, you will notice that I've placed, indeed, the range of congressional power on top as it belongs, over the range of powers among state legislatures, on top because it will always control, and rightly so, when it does apply, pursuant to the Supremacy Clause in Article VI. The entire gray zone is here characterized as clauses deemed to authorize Congress to define crimes against the United States. At the left-hand margin, you will note that it extends even into some areas where states may not operate by criminal law at all. And that is a continuous feature of all three models, and one in which I do not doubt is correct. An easy example is the enumerated power vested in Congress to punish piracy on the high seas or offenses <coughs> against the law of nations. The whole subject matter is preempted. State legislatures are divested of any prerogative to interest themselves in the criminality of such transactions overseas, and an explicit precautionary set of powers is vested in Congress to deal with those matters. I don't doubt that it is correct. On the other hand, the modernist model, which Judge Buckley has already insinuatingly reported to you in summarizing 200 years of case law, goes clear over to the same far boundary line at the right edge, as does the far extreme boundary of state power as well. In that respect, it would draw no distinction between the capacity in Congress to criminalize sodomy if it chose to, or indeed to criminalize anything else within the talent and capacity of any state legislature so to do. It is very difficult for me to find any enumerated power in the Constitution which reports a concession to national majorities so to treat the matter. Um, and on the three-page handout I have provided you, I have conveniently listed the evolution in the, what I have called borrowing from what he regards as the attractive phraseology of Professor Bruce Ackerman at Columbia, and I now regard it with a, a good degree of jauntist uh, sarcasm, the transformative interpretations of the Commerce Clause. You will notice it is first phrased in its pedestrian uh, original, indeed, the way it still appears, in case anyone should care. Congress shall have power to regulate commerce among the several states, underwent in 180 years of staffing of Supreme Courts and then its gradual acquiescence to claims by Congress through several transformative stages. The first was to interpolate the, the power to regulate or prohibit commerce among the several states. It was then to reach out to regulate whatever may affect commerce among the several states, though it is not among the several states and is not commerce 
<laughs> and within the last 15 years, the last step has been taken that inasmuch as it has been observed that what states may themselves do in providing, for instance, even part-time summer employment to teenagers in the maintenance of a local park, may obliquely in some way affect commerce, though it is not part of commerce, does not interfere with commerce, and does not presume to regulate commerce, nonetheless it is subject to regulation by Congress. And thus the closing form, penultimate form, is that Congress shall have power to regulate the states. Indeed, the consolidated form as derived from the case law, I assure you, and not in a mood of levity, though partly one of professional despondency, is that Congress shall have power to enact any criminal or civil legislation conducive in its view to the best interests of the United States. I merely put an asterisk to suggest that you compare the Commerce Clause and the Tenth Amendment, which may still be fulfilled, such powers as are not delegated, it says, to the national government, are reserved to the states respectively. But if you attend then the ultimate definition and look at the corresponding graphic, there is no power not delegated to the national government, thus there is nothing reserved. The Tenth Amendment has been construed literally to constitute an empty set. The other models I want to draw attention to and then come back to a civil liberties theme, which I find surprisingly interesting and, and wonderfully supported by famous New Deal judge, Felix Frankfurter. The other models report two different views. The one in the middle is the conventional one. Uh, you'll notice that, the, it, that it, it still stretches a zone of congressional criminal law enactment authority considerably over on top that may cross over much that states may do because that would mean that even pursuant to a moderate interpretation of each enumerated power expressly vested in Congress, Congress has the option to carry each of those enumerated powers into execution by criminal statute and not merely by civil statutes. But that the range of subjects is nonetheless severely constrained and thus with regard to a serious range of subject matter, no national authority is granted to deal with those whether by civil or criminal law at all. Rather, in the short time I have, I want you to look up the first model because under a very entertainable, strict construction view of the Constitution, indeed a view which John Marshall used in an equivalent circumstance in the most famous case in American constitutional history, Marbury versus Madison, a strict construction view would have confined Congress very narrowly indeed. You will notice in that graphic the clauses authorizing Congress to define crimes against the United States now is very slight. It still shows that it extends to some things states can't reach. How does it get so small? It gets small in the following way. As you may not have noticed, there are about five or six express clauses in the Constitution that deal explicitly with a power in Congress to prescribe crimes and to provide for the punishment of those crimes. I've already mentioned one or two. Piracy on the high seas, offenses against the laws of nations. Another appears in Article I. Congress is expressly vested with the authority to provide for the punishment of the counterfeiting of the national currency. Another and perhaps more familiar one appears in Article III, which within limits allows Congress to define and to provide for the punishment of treason against the United States. What is the point? The point is that the subject matter of dealing with national power by crime, by criminal prescription and punishment, apparently is expressly provided for. It is arguable that by a process of strict construction, the Constitution having described in what environments Congress may proceed by enacting criminal statutes, it necessarily implies an exclusion of any authority to deal with anything else by criminal statute as distinct from civil statute. Take, for instance, the example Judge Buckley gave you, the use of the postal power. Unlike the clause in the Constitution dealing with the currency of the United States, which again expressly provides for a power to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting of that currency, there is nothing in the postal power 
enabling Congress expressly to provide for any kind of punishment as such, as distinct from civil regulation, as distinct from setting up the post office, determining the rates to be charged, providing civil remedies against those who may abuse it, as restitution uh, or anything else, prohibitory injunctions. The normal maxim in this area would be that where the Constitution takes care to express itself affirmatively on a certain topic, then it is not otherwise given to Congress to deal with that topic by the same means. It is indeed the very maxim that John Marshall applied in Marbury. The Constitution having presumed to say in what instances the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction, the court read that to imply that Congress could not grant to the court original jurisdiction in any additional cases at all. It's simply a straightforward application of the Latin maxim of expressio unius, exclusio alterius est, that all Federalists should certainly know. <clears throat> now, I present that to you not ultimately because I believe it correct, but because I believe it cogent, logical, strong, and indeed, if one were of an inclination to construe the Constitution with some kind of outside telic agenda, that is a purposive agenda, as a strong libertarian, the language will bear this construction. Your civil liberties uh, uh, intentions and interests and aspiration would drive you in this direction. The precedent for applying maxims of this sort is numerous and strong. It could, I assure you, easily have been done. It is not correct, in my view, rather the middle graphic is correct, simply by chance that it would not faithfully report what was nonetheless contemplated in 1789. It is merely an excellent and ingenious argument. It is, however, an actual falsification. My point in presenting it to you, therefore, is merely to imply at the same time the modernist view is itself an equivalent falsification. The language will bear the various malconstructions which Congress has self-servingly granted itself over a period of decades and which an acquiescent Supreme Court has come to rationalize, abdicating its duty of Federalist review, which James Wilson, a nationalist in the Pennsylvania Convention, as well as James Madison, a Federalist in the Virginia Convention, insisted would be the most strenuous obligation of the Supreme Court to monitor the boundary lines of federalism according to which the states could then safely ratify this gamble, this constitution. It is a, an agreement, as it were, I dare say, that has not quite been kept. There is one additional complication. I said that I would refer to a surprising New Deal judge. In my view, the casualty of this modernist version has not merely been the archaeological loss, as it were, of federalism in the Tenth Amendment, and indeed something lost to the diversity of civil liberties choice, of adding the feasibility of movement and exit to vote and voice. It has also now begun to create terrible troubles under still another provision in the Bill of Rights, and that is the double jeopardy clause in the Fifth Amendment. As I'm sure you know, successive prosecutions brought first by state and then by federal personnel, or first by federal and then by state personnel, on essentially the same disputed factual transaction, are generally tolerable despite the double jeopardy clause in the Fifth Amendment, solely because of the principle of dual sovereignty. So to take the easy case, it may very well be that a state prosecutes a person for the state crime of larceny by trick, where the trick was that the person sought knowingly to pass counterfeit currency in defrauding another of their property. And the federal government, though the person is acquitted, is not then precluded from bringing a transaction to second guess the acquittal verdict of the state jury for the separate offense of counterfeiting the currency of the United States. Now there is, in the first instance, no violation of the double jeopardy clause, though indeed the person has been put twice in jeopardy for exactly the same disputed activity. But it cannot be otherwise, and I acknowledge it to be so, because the interest of the United States is clear in forestalling the debasement of its currency, and that interest is simply not subsumed in the distinctive uh, interest of the state to protect persons from being defrauded through larceny by trick. In short, 
though there is double jeopardy, it is explicable and it is not logical, feasible, or constitutional to allow the interest of the one sovereign to be completely contingent upon the fortuitous outcome of the trial conducted by the other. But it is an endurable principle, an endurable qualification to double jeopardy, only so long as there are indeed genuinely separate sovereign interests at stake. What has happened is that pursuant to the modernist view, it is no longer of constitutional consequence to try to discover why Congress adopted the law. Indeed, many acts of Congress, as you must be aware, are merely exercises of political Me Too-ism. That is, they say, Congress wishes to express its indignation over certain kinds of conduct for political uh, purposes, as it were. But to the extent that the law rests on exactly the vindication of the identical set of interests already subsumed in the fabric of the state substantive uh, criminal law, one may not any longer rationalize the constitutional permissibility of bringing successive prosecutions and second guessing the verdict of haute perfois equipped. Because of modernist doctrine, however, the Supreme Court is helpless to superintend the bona fides application of the double jeopardy clause. It is why, in my view, Felix Frankfurter, appointed by Franklin Roosevelt, who otherwise voted in the main to sustain acts of Congress, nonetheless dissented on pure federalism grounds in a very famous case involving an act of Congress that, that, made, uh, that imposed a, a penalty tax on wagering. I believe he did so partly because of Tenth Amendment concerns, but partly because Frankfurter, though a New Deal justice, quite enthused with the needs of spreading congressional authority to deal with the Great Depression, the collapse of national and international markets, nonetheless was a great criminal proceduralist and worried very much about the disparagement of the values of the double jeopardy clause. So he dissented in the case and said the following, when oblique use is made of the taxing power, as to matters which substantively are not within the powers delegated to Congress. This court cannot shut its eyes to what is obviously because designedly an attempt to control conduct which the Constitution left to the responsibilities of the states merely because Congress wrapped the legislation in the verbal cellophane of a revenue measure. What a wonderful phrase. Verbal cellophane of a revenue measure. Why does Frankfurter as a New Deal judge care? Because he was strong on criminal procedure rights. Because if you read his case law in the double jeopardy field, you will see that he does not likely condone systematic violations of the principle of that clause by contemplating successive and harassing prosecutions being brought under the camouflage of dual sovereignty. If, however, you do not police federalism, you cannot police the double jeopardy clause the one falls victim to the machinations of the other. Indeed, I bring this archaeological recitation to a close simply by quoting again <clears throat> from a senator whom I wasn't very fond of when I came to North Carolina and gradually grew immensely fond of, Sam Irvin, who in Watergate hearings at one time began to waggle those eyebrows and to remind us what a tangled web we weave when we practice to deceive. We have deceived the integrity of federalism, and we are now caught in a tangled web of double jeopardy anxieties as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. I have just one problem with your graph, and that's number two seems to me the width of that top line will be determined how strictly one construes the clauses that are deemed to authorize Congress yeah. uh, to define crimes. Uh, we next uh, move on to my esteemed colleague, uh, Judge David B. Santel, who was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit in 1987. His intelligence and good humor reached the court just in time to help console us for the loss of our honorable and honored colleague, Judge Robert Bork. Prior to his arrival on the DC Circuit, Judge Santel distinguished himself as United States District Court in the Western District of uh, North Carolina. He's graduated with honors from the University of North Carolina Law School in 1968, 
Later served his state as assistant U.S. attorney, state court trial judge, practicing attorney, and adjunct professor of criminal law at the University of North Carolina. I'm told that uh, the B in uh, Judge Sentel's name stands for Bloodworth. Perhaps he will tell us whether he is descended from the Mr. Bloodworth who at the North Carolina Ratification Convention in the summer of 1788 had this advice for his fellow delegates. Without the most express restrictions, Congress may tra trample on your rights. Every possible precaution should be taken when we grant powers. Rulers are always disposed to abuse them. Judge Sentel. Two corrections and a statement of interest. First correction, Judge Buckley told me before we began that he was going to attribute to me an ancestor and he did not want to know the truth of what my middle initial B stood for so that he could do that. It stands in fact for Brian and uh, I can't claim the distinguished ancestry that uh, Judge Buckley attributes to me. The second disclaimer, I'm not an academician. The uh, little thing in my biography that said I was a, uh, an adjunct professor of criminal law in fact, should have said at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, which was in an undergraduate department for a very short time and not in a law school. So that I speak not from the podium of an academician, but rather from someone who practiced law for a living in various capacities and worked at the law, what we call working lawyers as opposed to teachers or judges. I presume that some in this audience do that work. Uh, <laughs> And perhaps more will at some time, but in any event, I speak from that perspective. And to expand that statement of interest, as Charles Freed did yesterday when he began his, to speak on a case he had lost, he pointed out to us that he had lost that case. I was not in McNally, but a couple or three years before McNally, I had argued the same position that the defense argued in McNally in much lower courts, the district courts of North Carolina, U.S. district courts, with much, well, much less success than the defense did in the Supreme Court. I defended cases where people who had been accused of being involved in the ancient North Carolina industry of vote buying were charged not under election laws, but under, well, they were also charged under election laws, but they were charged under the mail fraud statute for defrauding the people of North Carolina out of their honest government and their honest elections, like the McNally defendants were charged for their dissimilar scam for uh, defrauding the people of their state out of their honest government. I argued to the district court with a singular lack of success that this was not the intended reach of the mail fraud statute and it was not proper federalism the district court did not agree. I never went any higher with the argument because I was fortunate enough to prevail on other grounds when the matter got to the juries in each instance. But I did not think then that I was committing any act of sophistry. I thought I was not only being a professional defense attorney at the time, but I was being correct. I'm one, I guess, Judge Buckley, of those who hasn't gotten the word and perhaps never will because I don't believe that the Tenth Amendment was intended to create an empty set. And perhaps if we see it today as an empty set, it's because we're not looking to see what is in there but has been veiled by uh, an improper treatment of the constitutional division of the powers of rule. We were told yesterday by Professor Grano, and I think quite rightly, that we should not cede the ground of Miranda or the ground of the exclusionary rules, we should not concede that the story is all told on that and that we're going on from there. I think the same is true of our very fundamental principle of federalism that the Tenth Amendment makes more or less explicit, but which I think is throughout, and that is that the criminal power, the police power over criminal acts is reposited with the states 
except where it is taken away by the Constitution or generously under the Supremacy Clause by laws made in pursuance of, by, by Congress in pursuance of the Constitution. And I think the prosecution in McNally had violated that principle of federalism and the principle of separation of powers. Because I think it's plain, and I think Judge Rehnquist is entirely correct, that when Congress enacted and reenacted and reenacted and amended in various forms the mail fraud statutes over the years, Congress at no time was legislating a regulation of corruption in state governments or in any other form the deprivation of so-called intangible rights. What Congress was intending to legislate about in at least arguably necessary and proper protection of the postal power was the use of the mails to deprive people of their property by schemes and artifice to defraud, as the statute describes them, what we might commonly call scams or cheats or whatever, but directed at taking people's money away from them, not at corrupting their government or depriving them of any form of intangible right. Now, in McNally, I think the result could have been very different. If you look at the particular, I think it was a scam involved there, there were, in fact, property rights being taken. There was money being defrauded. But I think this idea of central government pervasiveness, which has invaded our federalism, had blinded some of the prosecutors as to what their proper role was. After McNally had just been decided the same week, I was at the Fourth Circuit Judicial Conference, and the same assistant U.S. attorney who had been on the opposite side of both the vote fraud cases that I had argued the McNally, pre-McNally principle in, came to me at a cocktail party. By then I was a judge, and he said, Judge, did you hear about this case the Supreme Court decided on mail fraud? I said, yes, I did, Max. That's what I argued a couple of years ago. He said, yeah, but you were just doing your job. You realize McNally is really going to hurt us in doing our job. And I said, how so? And he said, well, isn't it our job to pursue corruption? Implicitly, I guess he meant corruption in state governments. And I told him, no, Max, it's not. And he seemed very shocked that I told him it was not his job to pursue corruption. It's not. He is a part of the executive branch. It's his job to execute the laws. If Congress, in some manner pursuant to the Constitution, did in fact a, uh, when they do in fact enact statutes that involve the pursuit of corruption, the prosecution of corruption, then it's his job to execute that law. But when they enact a mail fraud statute, dedicated instead to the protection of property rights, then the proper role of the executive is to pursue those scams that are depriving people of their property rights by the use of the mails, those scheme and artifices, use of the mails in furtherance of the scheme. Not only is it a violation of the legislative province by the executive to step over and redefine what Congress is going after, but it is further a violation of the prerogative of the states. Without speaking, and perhaps I shouldn't in a non-case or controversy fashion, as to whether or not Congress could constitutionally pursue the use of the mails in the corruption of state governments, and I think that's a nice question and one that perhaps some non-judge on this panel should address. I'm not sure I should because I don't know what drafts Congress has before them at the moment. But without pursuing whether they could constitutionally, I think it is plain from the history of the mail fraud statute that they haven't yet. And whatever the maximum reach is of federal criminal law, the scope of its proper application is only so far as Congress has taken it away from the state. Until then, the state has the repository of the police power. Now that lays to one side the question of what the state can legitimately do without violating the individual rights. Certainly there are great limitations on the exercise of the state's police power by the 14th Amendment and by the incorporations that have been done and by explicit parts of the Constitution, but the state's police power is not limited by a federal override unless and until Congress constitutionally enacts something that does so. 
So I think the overuse of the mail fraud statute, evidenced in McNally and slapped down in Chief Justice Rehnquist's opinion, is in fact a violation of our federalism and of our separation of powers. And I think this decision in McNally was foreshadowed by another Rehnquist opinion, which I also think, so think was quite correct, from several years before he was Chief Justice. In 1974, at a time when I was a prosecutor, a case arose named U.S. v. Mays, that's M-A-Z-E, 414 U.S. 395, and it attracted very little attention because I don't think people outside of the criminal justice realm could see that it had an implication as to how the Supreme Court was possibly looking at certain things, or at least Justice Rehnquist was, who wrote the opinion for the court. In those days, I was a prosecutor, and I was a zealous prosecutor. Perhaps I was an overzealous prosecutor. And we looked at that mail fraud statute, and it said something to the effect It didn't say something to the effect. It said these words, if I can find it. Well, I can't find it, so I won't tell you the exact words, but it, all right, I left it laying over there. Somebody's it's good enough to pass it to me. It criminalized the following. Whoever having devised or intending to devise any scheme or artifice to defraud or for obtaining money or property by means of false or fraudulent pretenses, representations, or promises, ellipses, if you would, for the purpose of executing such scheme or artifice or attempting so to do, places in any post office or authorized depository for mail matter, ellipses again. Now, it specifically criminalized the use of the mails, the placing in mail uh, authorized depositories for mail matter, of anything for the purpose of executing such scheme or artifice to defraud. Now, what we used to do was find a scam We'd find us a con artist, and we'd find somebody mailing something within arm's reach of the con artist, and we'd prosecute him under the mail fraud statute. E.g., credit card fraud was very popular in those days. There were credit fraud rings. When you use the credit card, you generally do not use the mails. You go into a store, and you put your little card out, and the man or woman slides you through the little machine, and you've got what you wanted. You bought a tire, which you took out and sold to somebody for half price, or you've bought up something else you could dispose of through a fence. You're through. But after you leave the store, the merchant then mails the copy of the credit card slip into the issuing bank, which then says, no, Mr. Merchant, this is not a good credit card. It was stolen, it was fraudulently obtained, or whatever. We started prosecuting that as mail fraud because of the mailing by the merchants. Well, Justice Rehnquist, and I think quite rightly said, that's an incidental use of the mails. That isn't a use of the mails for the purpose of executing the scheme or artifice to defraud. And he said Congress has criminalized only the use of the mails in furtherance of the scheme, and therefore you cannot properly and constitutionally prosecute this way. What we had been doing was invading the province of the legislative branch. And I think at the same time, the province of the states, because unless and until Congress constitutionally takes it away, it's the states to regulate. It wasn't a big jump for Congress to say it was necessary and proper to the postal power to regulate the use of the mails in frauds. Whether it's right or wrong was a debate that was probably had 120 years ago. It wasn't a big jump. But it's a heck of a jump from what Congress actually said to say that anytime somebody is involved in a scheme or artifice to defraud and the mails incidentally happen to be used, then the federal government, the central government, is going to get into that. To make that leap is an invasion of the legislative by the executive, assisted by the judicial, and it's an invasion of our proper federalism. Time is just about out, and I think I may be even a hair over. But I would say that the short of it is that, to me, whatever the proper scope of federal criminal law is, it runs into a block of the state's power to be running the police power wherever the Constitution or the legislative branch of the federal government hasn't taken it away, and even then only when the legislative branch takes it away pursuant to the Constitution. Thank you.
Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> we will now hear from uh, Mr. Joseph DeGenevan, who has uh, just recently taken the plunge into private practice with the Washington firm of Bishop, Cook, Purcell, and Reynolds. After receiving his law degree from Georgetown University, Mr. DeGeneva devoted 18 years to public service, beginning, uh, including stands as a law clerk at the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, a service as staff counsel to um, Attorney General Edward Levy, to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, and from 1981 to 1983, as chief counsel on the, on the Rules Committee of the United States Senate. Uh, from 1983 until 1988, he was United States Attorney for the District of Columbia, uh, the largest such office in this country. Then despondent over a wave of judicial activism in favor of criminal defendants, <laughs> Mr. DeGeneva resigned his post shortly after learning that Judge Santel had been assigned to the court. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. DeGeneva. <laughs> Judge Buckley, thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased and honored to be here this morning. I'd like to spend my time discussing McNally, which you heard alluded to in the discussions this morning, and bring it to life a little bit to demonstrate why it was significant and why what it wrought was significant. I was frequently asked when I was United States Attorney for the District of Columbia what it was like to hold that job. And I opined at the time that it was a little bit uh, like being chosen captain of the U.S. Olympic javelin team and electing to receive. <laughs> <laughs> well, on June 24th, 1987, uh, I, along with uh, 92 other United States attorneys, woke uh, not knowing that we had been elected a captain of the U.S. Olympic javelin team and had elected to receive, and we thought it was safe to go back into the water that day. Uh, we woke up and found that there was a large fin uh, swimming around in our environs, and uh, that it was attached to a shark whose jaws uh, belonged to Charles McNally. In a 7-2 decision, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the mail fraud statute did not, did not apply to actions of a former Kentucky state official and a private individual in requiring that an insurance agent who had been selected to provide policies for the state and had been required to share the premiums from that work with an insurance agency in which all of the defendants had an interest. The reason was, according to the Supreme Court, that the mail fraud statute does not prohibit schemes to defraud the public to their intangible rights to honest and impartial government. Now, for those of us who had been using the mail fraud statutes for many years, we had heard during those many years the arguments which had been repeatedly rejected by federal circuit courts that the theory of prosecuting people for depriving citizens of their intangible right to honest and impartial government and we had seen the Supreme Court in the Mandel case deny cert on that very question. Some of us were a little confused because we couldn't find this particular interest spelled out in the statute. And indeed, the legislative history was abundantly clear that it had been designed to protect property rights. Indeed, in 1872, during the debate on the recodification, Representative Farnsworth, the sponsor of that recodification, 
in an apparent reference to the anti-fraud provision, said that the measures were needed to prevent frauds which are mostly gotten up in the large cities by thieves, forgers, and rapscallions, generally for the purpose of deceiving and fleecing the innocent people in the country. Delightful congressional debate in those days if we could only reconstruct it today. <laughs> the case sent shockwaves, as you might imagine, through federal prosecutors' offices all over the United States, and rightly so, because they had been relying on it quite properly, ethically and wisely, in the pursuit of official corruption, both state and federal. The interesting thing about the individuals involved in the McNally case is that they were all private individuals. Uh, one of them had been the former chairman of the Kentucky Democratic Party. Another had been the former Secretary of Public Protection and Regulation in Kentucky. Um, and the other gentleman was a private citizen. What they did was not a crime under Kentucky law. It's a very important point. What they did was construed to be a crime under federal law under the mail fraud statute and was properly so construed by the federal prosecutors in that case because they were following not only departmental policy but a long line of federal circuit cases from all over the country which said that this intangible right to honest and impartial government indeed was covered by the literal language of the mail fraud statute. Well, the Supreme Court said it wasn't. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating case. It's very short. And I do want to read to you one passage which really then started the debate within the Department of Justice and the legal community and Congress about what should be done to fix McNally. What should be done by way of a governmental response from the Congress to put back into federal law an enforcement mechanism to cover that kind of deprivation of an intangible right. <laughs> Mr. Justice White, speaking for the court, said, as the court said in a mail fraud case years ago, there are no constructive offenses. And before one can be punished, it must be shown that his case is plainly within the statute. Rather than construe the statute in a manner that leaves its outer boundaries ambiguous and involves the federal government in setting standards of disclosure and good government for local and state officials, we read the mail fraud statute as limited in scope to the protection of property rights. If Congress desires to go further, it must speak more clearly than it has. Well, that began the debate as to what should be told to Congress by the executive branch. And as Judge Buckley indicated in his introduction, there was an intense, interesting, fascinating debate within the Department of Justice as to just what that response should be. There were those who felt very, very strongly that because the issues involved were state and local, not whether or not you could pursue federal corruption by federal officials, United States officials, but what tools were available to pursue local and state officials who were violating the public trust. There was, of course, no doubt that people who violate the public trust and violate criminal laws simultaneously should be the subject of some concern. The question was how that should be done and by whom. I think it is a tribute to those who are concerned about the significance of issues like what our Constitution means and not just in the abstract, but in our daily lives as lawyers and citizens, that the debate which occurred at the department uh, was a wholesome, and I, I think from the broken glass and windows and various furniture which I saw strewn about the hallways on occasions, a vigorous one, uh, in which I think both sides had an opportunity to have their cases heard. 
there was deep concern about the use of various federal underpinnings for jurisdiction to be used in fashioning a new federal statute. The arguments were, I think, fascinating in the sense that here we were in 1987 uh, discussing an issue of deep concern to the American people, public corruption, uh, a subject with which uh, I was not unfamiliar uh, during my term as United States Attorney in the nation's capital, and it involved both local and federal corruption uh, during my tenure. Uh, so I must say that I was transfixed uh, by the argument, not because I was involved in it, which I was not. I was one of those 93 U.S. attorneys sitting on the sidelines wondering what, if anything, was going to be given to me as a result of this battle. I must tell you that I was initially concerned about the McNally decision. I was deeply concerned that federal prosecutors might be denied a very valuable tool in the pursuit of federal, state, and local corruption. I went back and I read McNally very carefully and I looked at the footnotes and I saw that the court was making some very fine distinctions about the kinds of instructions that had been given to the jury. Because McNally is not only a statutory interpretation case, it is a case about the kinds of instructions the judge should give in cases like this. Indeed, the court seemed to be hinting at some, in some places that had different instructions been given, a different result, result might have been obtained. And indeed, in subsequent cases from various circuits, the distinctions are now trying to be made by reading into instructions that were given that differ from the McNally instructions that certain property rights were in fact caught up in the crimes which were charged. That battle is now underway in circuits all over this country with courts going both ways. At any rate, suffice it to say that within the department, there were very strong views about whether or not the Commerce Clause should be used to try and grapple with this right to honest and impartial government. And a very interesting argument was born, and one which I had no position on this. As, as I indicated, I was sitting on the sidelines saying, if you all wouldn't mind just sort of deciding this, I'd really like to have a tool given back to me in some form so that I can continue not to have sleepless nights worrying about this. But one argument was made which I found fascinating, and it was to grab the guarantee clause of the Constitution and use it as the basis for creating a federal interest and nexus to deal solely with local and state corruption, which would not have otherwise been grabbable. As you know, the Constitution itself requires that the United States, quote, guarantee to every state a Republican form of government, end quote. And that language, which had not been used in the preamble of any federal legislation, to my knowledge, since the 1968 gun control legislation, there were individuals who made the argument that the state attorneys general and others county attorneys have problems in prosecuting these cases. Not just political problems, but real legal problems. In many instances, prosecutors' jurisdictions end at county lines. They, their subpoenas are worthless beyond those borders. Most of them do not have grand juries. Most of them do not have the ability to co compel people to testify before those grand juries without automatically giving them immunity. So there were structural problems that was being argued. Not constitutional problems, but simply structural problems. There was a need here, it needed to be filled. In addition, some states don't have grand juries, so that one of the most important tools for investigating corruption and schemes and artifices to defraud couldn't be used. And the argument went on that indeed in some instances there not only is a lack of legal will 
but there is a lack of political will to pursue such cases in the state, local, or county context because the subjects of the investigation are usually uh, the individuals with whom party fundraising activities will be occurring within a matter of days. And so the fear was among one group in the department that states and localities would in fact be incapacitated because of their own legal structures. The response to that was not that states were entitled to corrupt government if that's what they wanted, but that states were entitled to structure their legal systems as they wished, and if those impediments existed in the state of Kentucky or anywhere else, that was a problem for the people of the state of Kentucky or any other state to solve through the ballot box by either A, throwing the rascals out, or B, restructuring their legal system. That was an interesting argument. It is an argument which has great merit in the sense of viewing the relationship between the central government and a state. And the argument on the other side was that the federal government indeed had an interest under the Guarantee Clause in seeing that there was honest, impartial government at the state and local level and that the federal government needed to manifest that concern because of the growing public concern about corruption through a federal statute which would bring back into the federal criminal code protection of that intangible right through some amendments to the federal criminal code. That occurred and the department submitted to Congress in May of 1988 a statute which does in fact criminalize, or I should say recriminalize, the kind of conduct which was originally thought to be prohibited by the intangible rights theory of prosecution under the mail fraud statute. And I will simply read to you the proposed amendment to chapter 11 of title 18 a new section 225 entitled public corruption whoever in a circumstance described endeavors by any scheme or artifice corruptly to deprive or to defraud the inhabitants of a state or political subdivision of a state of the honest services of an official or employee of such state or subdivision shall be fined under the statute or imprisoned for not more than 10 years etc the decision was made on the part of the department. The 93 U.S. attorneys had let their views be known. They were very concerned that the absence of the intangible rights theory from the mail fraud statute would take something away from them that they needed very, very badly. The criminal division took the position that the statute was needed and the Office of Legal Policy and Legal Counsel took the different view that the statute, uh, even as proposed, really went too far uh, in usurping what certain individuals viewed to be the legitimate prerogatives of state and the expansion of the federal role into this area. Congress has not enacted the statute, that statute. Uh, the debate continues on how to fix, quote unquote, fix McNally. The issue will remain a hot one because the issue of corruption is a, is a, is a matter uh, necessarily and appropriately of deep concern of not only public officials but private citizens who do not want their tax money misspent. But I, su I submit to you that as, as a person who has not been a scholar interested in the notions of federalism, until recently, that the issue is an important one. That how we resolve this question in terms of the kind of federal legislation we pass on the issue, if any, uh, will tell us something about the way we will proceed in other areas. Uh, I, for one, having dealt with the area of public corruption, feel very strongly that prosecutors, assistant United States attorneys and U.S. attorneys ought to have at their disposal appropriate tools to pursue these kinds of crimes. I have not made up my own mind as to whether or not this particular statute 
is the way to do it. I'll probably get there by the time the vote is cast. Uh, that will be irrelevant to everyone in this room except me, of course. But the truth is, it is an interesting and important question. And McNally and its aftermath demonstrate very, very strongly that the issue of the relationship between the United States government and the several states on, on the issue of how to deal with local and state conduct is alive and well and in need of our attention if it is to receive proper treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Genova. Um, our final speaker is uh, Professor Robert Blakey, who is the O'Neill Professor of Law at Notre Dame, where he completed both his undergraduate and legal studies. He has also taught uh, at Cornell. From 1969 to 1972, Professor Blakey served as Chief Counsel of the Subcommittee on Criminal Laws and Procedures of the United States Senate and later served as Chief Counsel of the Select Committee on Assassinations of the House of Representatives. He is the author of and co-author of three books, including Organized Crime, The Public Record, and The Plot to Kill the President. And as you will soon find, he has also just learned the hazards of being the last to speak on a panel discussion. <laughs> Let me begin with a clarification. Uh, I did indeed uh, serve as the chief counsel and staff director on the House Select Committee on Assassinations. But as the State Department suggested uh, to us that when we talk to foreign embassies, we should always make it clear that we were studying them and not doing them. Uh, <laughs> and that uh, the uh, function of the committee was to look into the death of President, uh, President Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King. I should also uh, begin with a disclaimer. Uh, I am currently serving as a consultant to the Subcommittee on Criminal Laws and Procedures in the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, my portfolio includes the uh, looking at the proposed uh, McNally legislation. Indeed, I was uh, in the committee on May in May of 1988, when the department presented its uh, position. Um, the disclaimer is as follows. My position here today uh, should not in any sense be attributed either to Mr. Rodino or, or to Mr. Conyers, uh, the two principal people for whom I work. I speak for myself alone. I surely will have uh, enough weight to carry to defend it without having anyone attribute anything I say uh, to those two gentlemen. Uh, let me begin with a comment on um, Bill's modernist view and associate myself uh, with it. Uh, I think today the function of the uh, allegation of federal jurisdiction in the area of criminal law as it is practiced is about the same uh, significance as the allegation of a lease and release in the action and ejectment. Uh, it has long since uh, ceased to be real and is largely uh, a fiction. Uh, I come to that uh, when I immediately thought, as Judge Buckley was speaking, uh, that obviously daydreaming does affect commerce. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, fully accepted in the case law uh, construing the Commerce Clause, a notion of depletion of assets. Uh, and by that means is if the effect of the activity is to deplete a victim's assets, uh, he has then less money to spend in commerce and that of course affects commerce. Judge, if you spend too much time daydreaming, you won't be working. If you don't work, you won't have assets. And if you don't have assets, it's clear that that affects commerce. Uh, if anyone else wants to come up with an illustration of something that's outside the commerce clause, uh, please try. Uh, I've been drooling for some time to do that, and it's just <laughs> simply not possible. Uh, I was glad uh, to hear my 
good friend Bill also began with a quote uh, from Mr. Justice Frankfurter, surely one who is uh, uh, a friend of federalism. And that's where uh, I would like to begin. Justice Frankfurter put it well when he said, in law, the right answer usually begins on putting the right question. And I think that if we're going to put the right question here, uh, and I would like to focus on the McNally question because I think it's a good deal uh, more real than uh, worrying about sodomy. Uh, Bill, in fact, uh, nobody is prosecuted for sodomy uh, anywhere today. Uh, where sodomy prosecutions go down, they're normally public nuisance prosecutions. Uh, sodomy is indeed an issue in our society, but it is largely symbolic, it is not real. Uh, indeed, I would also comment at that point on uh, real. Uh, it's all well and good to point out that under the doctrine of dual sovereignty, you may have dual prosecutions. Uh, candor would also indicate that you should say uh, that the majority of our states and the vast majority of our citizens also live in states that have statutes that specifically prohibit dual prosecution and that our protection of liberties does not extend at that point from constitutional theory but from statutes. Uh, and therefore the fear of double jeopardy as an incident of dual uh, sovereignty is like the fear of prosecutions for sodomy uh, illusionary. If we are to put the right question to get the right answer uh, in the area of McNally, I suggest that we do do uh, what uh, Joe suggested, and that is begin with the Republican form of government clause. For my thesis is this, and it is simple. Federal prosecution of state and local corruption is not a matter of federalism, but a matter of preserving a Republican form of government. Let's begin with the text of the Constitution, for I fear too many of our discussions about federalism is a federalism without the benefit of the text of the Constitution. Article 4, section, section 4 provides, and I quote, the United States shall, notice it says shall, not may, shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. Exactly what the founders meant by Republican is not clear. But if the word meant anything, it meant non monarchy But Republican did not mean democratic, at least not in the pure sense of direct popular control and frequent elections. Yet the founding founders appeared to realize that the idealistic middle course of republicanism was not without its own shortcomings. In order to be viable, the new government of the United States would have to resist two principal threats to its integrity. One, faction, and two, corruption. Quote, by a faction, unquote, Madison later wrote, quote, I understand a number of citizens whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and, and aggregated entrance of the community." Close quote. Because of Shays' rebellion during the winter of 1786-1787, the consequences of faction were frighteningly familiar to the participants at the conviction. Advocating a strong federal power to suppress such rebellions, Mason stated, quote, if the general government should have no right to suppress rebellion against particular states, it will be in a bad situation indeed. As rebellions against itself originate in and against individual states, it must remain a passive spectator of its own subversion. The founders perceived susceptibility to corruption as another principal weakness of Republican governments. I now quote from Madison at the convention. 
Madison observed that the great difficulty in rendering the executive competent to its own defense arose from the nature of Republican government, which could not give to an individual citizen that settled preeminence in the eyes of the rest, that weight of property, that personal interest against betraying the national interest, which have pertained to a hereditary magistrate. In a republic, personal merit alone would be the ground of political exaltation. Would, be, would rarely happen that this merit would be so preeminent as to produce universal acquiescence. The executive magistrate would be envied and assailed by disappointed competitors. His firmness would need support. He would not possess those great emoluments of his station, nor that permanent stake in the public interest, which would place him out of reach of foreign corruption. He would stand in need, therefore, of being controlled as well as supported. Although the delegates were principally concerned with foreign corruption, they were not unaware of the potential for equally destructive effects from domestic sources. As recognized by Delegate Butler, quote, the two great evils to be avoided are cabal at home and affluence abroad, close quote. The delegates also expressed their concern for corruption elsewhere in the Constitution. Notably, they placed bribery right after treason on the list of impeachable offenses. Advocating the new Constitution, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay attempted to articulate the concern that had motivated the delegates at the convention. Beginning Federalist number three, Jay wrote, I mean to consider the public safety as it respects security for the preservation of peace and tranquility, as well as against dangers from foreign arms and influence, as from dangers of the like kind arising from domestic causes. Hamilton also warned, quote, one of the weak sides of republics among their numerous advantages is that they afford too easy an inlet to foreign corruption. In making his introductory remarks on the delegate's concern with corruption, however, Hamilton indicated that foreign governments were what but one potential source of destructive influence, quote, nothing was more to be desired then every practical obstacle could be opposed to cabal, intrigue, and corruption. These most deadly adversaries of Republican government might naturally have been expected to make their approaches from more than one quarter, but chiefly from the desire of foreign powers to gain an improper ascendancy in our councils. Hamilton added, quote, in Republican, Persons elevated from the masses of the community by the suffrages of their fellow citizens to stations of great preeminence and power may find compensations for repay, re, betraying their trust, which to any but minds actuated by superior virtue may appear to exceed the proportion of entrance that they have in the common stock and to overbalance the obligations of duty. Hence, it is to that history furnishes us with so many mortifying examples of the prevalency of foreign corruption in Republican governments. I shall not continue to read these quotes, for indeed they go on and on and on. The point to be made is that the concern was not only about foreign gold, it was about domestic gold. And this was a concern possessed and animating not only the Federalist, but indeed the Anti-Federalist who objected to the Constitution. This is not a Federalist issue. Let me quote from a speech made in the New York Constitutional Convention in 1788. Quote, this is by Delegate Smith. In so small a number of representatives, there is great danger from corruption and combination a great politician has said that every man has his price. I hope that this is not true in all its extent. But I ask the gentleman to inform what government there is in which it has not been practiced. Is this an extensive country, increasing in population and growing in consequence? 
very many lucrative offices will be in grant of the government, which will be the object of avarice and ambition. How easy will it be to gain over a sufficient number in the bestowal of these offices to promote the views and purposes of those who grant them? Foreign corruption is also to be guarded against. A system of corruption is known to be a system of government in Europe. It is practiced without blushing, and we may lay it to our account that it will be attempted among us. As a result of the Supreme Court's decision in Luther versus Borden, the courts have generally held that the enforcement of the guarantee clause is the principal task of Congress, not the judiciary. We have not therefore had that development of the themes in the guarantee clause that we've had in uh, the Commerce Clause and elsewhere. But I believe that a fair reading of the text, its original intent, in the context of the debates at the time, established the simple proposition that Congress has, as a matter of original intent, the power to act to protect state and local governments not only from foreign intrigue or domestic violence, but also corruption. If I am correct in this judgment, and I believe that I am, Congress has not only the power to act, it has the duty to act. The Constitution does not say Congress may, it says the United States shall, and I assume that Congress is included in the United States. Indeed, the United States, in the context of the Constitution at that point, includes the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. And therefore, when the judiciary comes to construe those federal statutes that touch on local corruption, they are not being unfaithful to their duty to, withhold, to uphold the Constitution, but faithful to it in applying it as they had prior to McNally, without dissent at the circuit court level. No circuit had gone in, in conflict on McNally. They had recognized clearly that the phrase scheme to defraud was followed by the phrase or, and that the property aspect of the mail fraud statute followed, but was preceded by a scheme to defraud not qualified by property language and had held, rightly I believe, that we all as citizens had an intangible right, I would add guaranteed by the federal constitution itself, to a government based on merit and not on gold. Accordingly, I do not think McNally, McNally was correctly decided, either as a matter of the text of the statute or indeed as it's of its legislative history. I do not think it was decided correctly as a matter of federalism. I think it was decided wrongly as a matter of the Constitution as a whole. In 1789, the chief danger was from corruption by foreign gold. Today, it is domestic cash. Either way, it is the people who are cheated out of the blessings of liberty under a Republican form of government. And I see no reason in federalism why that should be tolerated. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you've confirmed my suspicion that Madison was a very devious man because I find it hard to square what I've just learned from you uh, with uh, Federalist Paper Number 43 uh, in, the dis in discussing the Guarantee Clause. But nevertheless, um, I've just been received uh, strict orders from Chairman M Meyer uh, that this panel must come to a halt in mid-sentence if necessary at 12.15. Uh, our original plan was to have each of the panelists uh, uh, spend a few minutes uh, criticizing what every other panelist has said. Uh, I will give the panelists that opportunity if they insist. Otherwise, I will proceed with questions from the floor. I understand a judge uh, when he uh, gives an order. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
So if people will um, start lining up these microphones, we have one in each wing here. Uh, the, w the questions uh, are to be terse and to the point and not excuses for lectures. Uh, at the close of this uh, meeting, everyone is to run, not walk, to the state dining room for lunch. Okay. Um, if the um, if federalism really means anything, I'd like to know: Does the federal government really have the power to prosecute state crimes merely by saying that because the money received from the crime was not reported by the defendant on his 1040 form, which he filed the succeeding April, that this constitutes um, federal income tax uh, evasion? I'd like to know if federalism really means anything. Does the federal government really have the power to do this? I bring up the tax statute because it's a lot broader in, in scope than any of the statutes that have been mentioned this morning. I'd just like each member to say yes or no. And and give their give their reasons for their position. Who, let, let, let me let me answer the question that way. If you don't pay your taxes, uh, you surely cheat the government. If you would hold that because the money was illegally obtained, that is through crime, uh, therefore it would follow that on a principle of federalism, you could not be uh, prosecuted for tax evasion. You would set up a double standard. One set of standard for the honest citizens who work and earn and necessarily pay their money, and another uh, standard for the racketeers. And the, the tax laws would, would apply to the good guys and not the bad guys. And I see no reason in federalism to adopt that position. It is incidental that Al Capone was a bootlegger. He was also a tax evader, and he was prosecuted federally for tax evasion. At the time he was prosecuted for tax evasion, there was another case pending against him for bootlegging, which at that time was uh, a federal offense. When he got 10 years for tax evasion, the Department of Justice decided not to prosecute him for bootlegging on the grounds that it would be a waste of federal resources. Both decisions to prosecute him for bootlegging and for tax evasion seem to me to be perfectly rational and to raise no federalism problems. I concur with Bob. I concur completely. I don't see any difference in the tax obligation of a citizen who earns his living illegally, his income illegally in a state, and a citizen who earns it legally in a state. They both owe taxes. They both can be prosecuted for criminal failure to comply with the tax statutes. Okay. Uh, the next question, would the questioners uh, direct their questions to one of the panelists? Um, well, actually, I, it's, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, they, okay. they can okay. volunteer it's be to tough answer. To Under the principles of federalism, I would like any of the panelists to comment on the current frenzy, and not just the current, but been going on for quite some time, in regard to the drug laws. We heard yesterday the House of Representatives passed. These are all, let's face it, essentially local crimes. The transactions all take place at a place within a particular state. And there are, in every one of these states, these tra tra transactions are forbidden. And under the Constitution, there is no delegation to the federal government regarding drugs. How, under the principles of federalism, can we possibly support this type of legislation? And I would like anybody to comment on that, particularly somebody of, of a federalist bench. Well, I'll try. Uh, I'll, I'll try, but this is not on, evidently. Oh. Actually, it's very complicated uh, because the current statutes will indeed make uh, it a federal crime to possess a single gram of marijuana that you may grow in a flower pot uh, on your own veranda. In short, the former connections having to relate it to uh, marijuana originating in a different state or in a foreign country have been abandoned in the more far-reaching acts of Congress. And thus, one does find oneself, uh, under your question, in an actual situation, that in the state of Alaska, the state Supreme Court has held under the state's constitution that the private possession for home consumption of small amounts of marijuana is actually a state constitutional right in the frontier state of Alaska. Nonetheless, though it has no commercial connection at all with anyone or anything else, a person who attempts to exercise that Alaskan constitutional right commits a federal crime. The reason your question is complicated, therefore, is that there are varieties of drug trafficking laws. I have no difficulty, for instance, insofar as the Congress of the United States does not wish to allow international commerce, whether in coffee beans or in marijuana. 
indeed the foundations for its distaste for coffee beans or marijuana, is a discretion that is committed to it by its power to control commerce with foreign nations. But it does not stop there. And when it goes on as it has under the drug control laws, there is no doubt that at some point it then has clipped off and substituted for the acceptability of private conduct that the state sees nothing improper about at all, a supererogatory judgment of its own. Now, I don't doubt that that is in, uh, in, in every serious way inconsistent with the authentic Constitution of the United States. But I don't want to be misunderstood, therefore, saying all of the drug trafficking laws are of a piece. They are simply not. You have to deal with this in a lawyer-like way. My difficulty with Professor Blakey's position, for instance, is, is not that there is nothing to be said for it, um, and I'll intrude the comment here, but that again, I think that the, uh, the principle he, he, uh, he's in touch with may carry entirely too far. The idea that the government may intervene, for instance, to put, to put down a Munich beer-style putsch to overthrow a state government and to substitute a plutocracy leads him to conclude that they, are, they may also attempt to interfere against kleptocracy. It is therefore a small step <laughs> to say that any attempt to bribe a state official is a federal crime, even though it is simultaneously a state felony to attempt to bribe a state official. That's a very large gap. Most of his constitutional law want to go very carefully when Congress presumes to exercise additional claims of powers, now under a newly discovered one, Blakely proposed one to guarantee a Republican form of government. Give me one other example and then desist. Just to make the larger point, that these are difficult but shaded and graduated problems. The only act of Congress the Supreme Court has held invalid for want of power to adopt it, without that decision in turn being overruled, in the last 47 years, only one was the instance where Congress presumed to lower the eligible voting age even in state and local elections. Many of you may recall it, Oregon versus Mitchell. But if you're not extremely cautious about the lure of Professor Blakey's otherwise very attractive uh, appeal to you here, certainly it will more nearly provide a, quote, Republican government in the sense of more adequately representative, uh -uh to expand the pool of eligible qualified voters in state and local elections. By that gesture, Congress indeed should have been sustained in its effort to seize command of voting age criteria uh, for those eligible to vote even in state and local elections. It may be only because of the lack of so gifted a suggestion as Professor Blakely's that the Supreme <laughs> Court did not sustain that act. So if you compare those two statutes, they duplicate and mimic one another. Indeed, other than in the situation of practically military commotion, Munich Beer Hall style putches, my own attitude is to take a very skeptical attitude toward any claim of Congress in expanding its power through that vehicle, just as I've been highly skeptical of its abuses of the commerce power as well. Indeed, uh, so far as the proposed statute is concerned, if you listen to it, what it is one is being deprived of, the people's quote, right to honest and impartial government, on non-constitutional grounds alone, I'm rather chilled by the ambiguity and inviting draconian capacity of a statute as that, to second-guess state statutes that may monitor what is and is not a lawful contribution to a campaign fund. Uh, so I would want to go very cautiously on any theory that tries now even to draw from an additional hitherto untapped power in Congress. I'm sorry I've been gone beyond your question, but I hope it's at least responsive as well. Yeah, I can't speak directly to your question, but I'm going to speak a little bit anyway. As a judge, I, don't, I can't speak on the Constitution of the specific things, but I would like to echo just a little bit and perhaps change direction just a hair in that in the area both of drugs and public corruption, there is too much temptation to our side of the debate, if you would, to let the sanctity of the goal, the purity of our objective, obscure the way we get there. There was one thing that Dershowitz said yesterday that was true. There may have been as many as two, but there was one thing <laughs> that, that was true, and that was that the destruction of protections for criminals, whether they be drug dealers or corrupt public officials, is the destruction of the same protections for everybody else. So that if we let our federalism be invaded by our zeal for law enforcement, uh, 
the trees that we cut down so the devil couldn't hide from us won't be there when the devil turns on us. So yeah. I think you raise a very real question. Uh, we'll brush on to the next question. Thank you. Uh, I address this to you. I'm the evil spirit from Yale who drafted the 10 laws that put the federal government in the crime business. And at that time, Hatton Summers, who was uh, just a little fellow from Texas, said, young man, when crime gets bad enough, you people out there in Illinois will take care of it. The problem seems to me now, how are we going to take the legislative power out of the courts and, and uh, put it back where it belongs? Other than, as the Wall Street Journal just suggested, a constitutional amendment uh, like Switzerland and France, who, by the way, uh, I've just been in Switzerland discussing this very problem. And uh, they say, uh, you can do it. We've done it the way Madison suggested originally. Well, clearly, the Federalist Society must organize a new political party and make it its platform to only elect people who will decline to legislate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, to, and to ratify, uh, and who will in, in turn uh, uh, confirm only judicial candidates who will uh, not uh, substitute for legislators. Um, my name is Neil McDonald. My question is for Mr. De Geneva. Uh, has to do with the fact that we do not have a problem of federalism in the District of Columbia. And while you were sitting on the sidelines with the other 92 U.S. attorneys, uh, did that occur to you? And uh, if you could review for us the uh, legislative process in the District of Columbia with respect to uh, mail fraud and uh, tell us if uh, you think there should be a, a separate bill for the district or whether it uh, will be covered under this uh, bill. I think the, the, the thrust of your question has been made. We have one minute for an answer. <laughs> well, let me just say that, that, that there's a unique situation in the District of Columbia, of course, since this is a federal enclave. The United States Attorney, unlike the other United States Attorney, is also the equivalent of the State Attorney General and has the authority to enforce a local code which previously had been enacted by Congress and now new additions to which are enacted by the Council of the District of Columbia. So we had a few options available to us as the United States Attorney which were not available to other federal prosecutors and so we did not necessarily face the same problem that other United States Attorneys did. Um, the need for a specific statute here does not immediately commend itself to me uh, in, in terms of the local situation because we have sufficient tools available to us at this point to deal with the problem. However, the fact that the mail fraud statute may be um, disembodied at this point with regard to certain intangible rights is a subject that needs to be addressed, now, whether it needs, uh, not because of the situation in the District of Columbia, however. Thank you, Mr. Genevan. Uh, we have finished on time.